Hi everyone, this is Wendy Mews, the creator of the Left Pocket Project, a platform that seeks to bring you the history of leftists of color one swipe at a time. And this is the Left Pocket Project podcast. Before I begin today's episode, I wanted to start off as usual by thanking everyone who's been retweeting, reposting, sharing, liking, and supporting the Left Pocket Project on social media and on Patreon. Your support means a lot, and you help the project and the podcast stay afloat. So thank you once again. Some of you also make my day in my mentions. Here's an idea of what I've seen people saying recently about the Left Pocket Project. A tweet from one user said, quote, Left POC is an incredible resource. Thank you very much. Another noted that Left POC has been, quote, setting the standard in leftist programming. Get caught up and follow immediately. Thanks for that, too. Another listener referred to the Left Pocket Project podcast as, quote, a far better alternative than a podcast that will remain unnamed. No misogyny, no uncomfortable jokes, just good, wholesome POC radicalism. When I receive feedback like this, it helps remind me that the time I spend on the project is not in vain. And I'm actually really happy that the histories and issues that I've discussed with guests on the podcast or the information on the lives of leftists of color that I post online really mean something. Accordingly, in this episode, I speak with Richard, better known as Progressive Green on Twitter, on an upcoming series that we'll be doing as part of the Left Pocket Project that we hope will further expand the project and make it an even better resource for everyone. I'm here today with uh, Richard. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. So can you tell the audience a little bit about who you are, what you do, and also how we know each other? All right. Uh, yeah, uh, I I guess I didn't. You probably told me that I was going to be doing this, but I didn't prepare <laughs> <laughs> to talk about myself. But uh, like, I guess I just I see myself as, you know, a citizen uh, of the United States currently. And I'm sorry. I'm no, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And from that, you know, uh, I feel an obligation to be engaged in my democracy. And from uh, that perspective, I started i followed politics pretty much my whole life i guess uh i've had a checkered past i guess without disclosing a whole lot uh, i mean i've <laughs> i've uh i don't know i've i've lived a life i guess uh, not the academic pursuit life that i think a lot of the people uh both uh, in uh, the groups that i've joined and a lot of the people that i've been interacting with uh on twitter and politically uh i I'm more of a just uh, I dropped out of high school before going to college and uh, have uh, got my associates and planned on finishing my bachelor's and, uh, you know, didn't get quite that far. But I so I, I, I've learned most of my things. Most of what I've learned has been self-taught and through uh, just desperately seeking information pretty much my whole life and even throughout school. So that's a little bit, I guess, about that, how I became more politically active, even more so, or I'd say politically active instead of just uh, following along, uh, was part of the Bernie campaign. And uh, uh, essentially, there was this online production called Bernie 2016 TV that some people may be familiar with. And I was just watching one day, and they were just talking about some issues related to uh, black people. And I was just like, wow, this is a lot of old white men talking about issues related to black people. <laughs> uh, and so I, and they, they, they did what they could do and they actually requested that people reach out. And so like, that was enough to make me think, well, uh, I'm not, you know, a scholar like Wendy or I'm not uh, an activist. <laughs> and, uh, a, uh, well, I mean, I, I have a lot of respect and uh, an immense amount of gratitude to just be here. And thank you again, Wendy. But I didn't have a lot of the experience that a lot of other people had uh, that I listened to or that I respected, that I respected their views now. Uh, but I knew that they had nothing and I was probably better than nothing. And so <laughs> that's that's how I got engaged. And so uh, I tell that uh, the only reason I tell that story, I guess, is because uh, I hope that what we're going to be doing can help that for help do that for other people that 
people that have paid some attention to politics or have been acutely aware of how badly they're getting hosed by the political system, but haven't really found a way to uh, get engaged. And so that's, that's, uh, regardless of one's background, uh, we all have things that we can do that can help. And, uh, we talked briefly before about, uh, Anyway, we, we, I don't want to get sidetracked, so <laughs> I'll, try, I'll, try, I'll try to stay focused. I know Wendy's really good on this. So. All right, so I'll try to really back in, although I think that was perfectly fine and clear. Um, I think, though, that one of the things, we'll, we'll reveal exactly what we're going to be doing in a minute. We haven't revealed it yet. Um, yeah, but yeah. first of all, I just want to say I didn't pay him to say positive things about me. Um, <laughs> so I was not, not expecting that, but thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I always sort of say something like all the guests I have on are much more interesting than I am. And like the histories that they talk about are much more interesting than I am. And I think that that also applies here. So just to repay a compliment that I really mean, um, I actually came across Richard's work by way of progressive army, actually, because you and several others who were writing for or doing like video shows for progressive army, um, came together for what used to be called Project Sanity, and then now it's called The Discourse, correct? Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I found about I found a little bit about your perspective by watching that show, and every now and then you'd interject with things to kind of check even the guests sometimes I saw. Um, <laughs> you'd interject and say, well, eh. you always were kind of the devil's advocate, but in a really good way, a positive way to kind of bring things back to a more solid sort of intersectional leftist perspective, which I really appreciated. Um, so when I started this project, Richard was nice enough to reach out to me and say, like, we should do something together. And I'm thinking of these ideas, as, like better ways to kind of reach a broader audience, um, and some things that we can do to actually not just talk about what people did in the past, but also some of the ideas that they laid out, um, and, you know, what they put in writing, right? Cause you, I think you mentioned literally, like you wanted to read stuff along with the, with the listeners, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's uh, uh, I, I want I, I'm learning and I know I'm not the only one and I don't want people to be shy or embarrassed to admit that, you know, they may be radically supporting some particular political thing and not necessarily understand some of its history or how we got to where we're at. And uh, I think that that energy is good, but that information is valuable as well. And so uh, I wanted to find a way to blend those two together and to share that experience with people. Right. So um, Richard and I actually came up with a project, a pro- project. What am I Canadian now? Like we came up with a project that was a, a combination of project and program, but it ended up making me sound like I was Justin Trudeau or something. So uh, we, <laughs> we came up with a project, uh, a project about a way to blend, you know, the things that we read and we talk about and actually make it um something that people can engage in themselves and listen to. And especially thinking about the fact that like not everyone has time to sit down and read a long book or to read several books, or some people can't read. Some people have problems reading in terms of ability, just in general. Um, There are all sorts of things that can keep people from having access, clear and easy access to reading. And just also the other thing that I always think about too, is the fact that I wasn't exposed to any of this stuff until I started doing grad school. You know, I mean, we learn about five seconds of what the communist manifesto was. We learned who Karl Marx is in like a sentence in our history books in high school. And then in college class issues and, and sort of some of these, these philosophers and thinkers come up, but again, a lot of their records and ideas are whitewashed or sort of obscured. And so Richard and I came up with the idea to do something, a project <laughs> <laughs> as a sub project of the left pocket project called reading revolution. And so what Richard and I will do, will be doing is we'll be reading articles, essays, speeches, and books, um, written by a lot of left POC and also by some of the, what we would normally consider like the canon, if you will, um, sort of the classics (laughs) of leftist thought. So people like Marx, Luxembourg, et cetera. Um, and we wanted to really make this something that people could just listen to while you're driving home from work, while you're working out, while you're doing whatever you do. Um, but you could also learn about the ideas, thoughts, and and philosophies of a lot of the people that I talk about during the regular Left POC projects or the Left Pocket Project podcast. Um, so Richard and I have actually come up with a list of a lot of different people. Um, that's obviously an ever expanding list, but we'll be touching on things like labor rights, um, human rights, how to think about race, how to think about 
um, gender within a communist or Marxist or leftist, any, you know, fill in the blank, um, left-leaning ideology, how these things fit. Also talking quite a bit about imperialism and statehood and war and any other issues um, that these thinkers themselves put to print. Um, we'll be reading it, or at least trying to <laughs> trying to read it. Most likely we'll come together about once a month or so, depending on our schedules, but we'll read it. We'll do the reading for you. And then we'll talk about it. So hopefully, you know, the listeners can get some enjoyment out of it. But yeah, but I really, what was it? I mean, I know you mentioned earlier that you really wanted people like who perhaps, one of the things that I should say, one of the things that motivated you was the fact that, you know, sometimes people weren't exposed to things um, and they would pick up a book maybe and read on their own. In your case, what was it that compelled you to start digging into more um, alternative or left-leaning politics personally? For me, I, I've always been more of an audiovisual person, and so uh, even with Ber with, with Bernie and like as I mentioned before, with how I got involved in uh, Bernie twenty sixteen TV, but with Bernie, it was his first video, and I the first thing that I kind of did was I made uh, my own Bernie video that was when everybody was talking about oh you know Bernie's uh, attacking Hillary and being unfair to her. I had taken a comp compilation of, you know, the dozens of times that uh, when he was getting interviewed and they were trying to get bait him into attacking her, he would go out of his way to try to bring it back to the issues and and how much that was frustrating the media. And so the, the audio visual, I've always found that that was a really good way for me to be able to capture things, especially more so with the. Uh, my production abilities as limited as they be than my speaking abilities, but I was kind of pushed into this uh, by feel feel of need, and so that uh, not this project, but uh, <laughs> <clears throat> I was pushed into like speaking about things, both uh, by people in my life that support me uh, as far as uh, you know w me speaking my mind and gave me confidence that I had something that was of value to offer to people. And then the people that continue to do that as I've progressed through uh, Burning 2016 onto PA and, as you mentioned, Project Sanity and the discourse. And so with that, I figure the one way that I, I, the audiovisual is really good. So what really triggered me to war towards radicalism was when I started to learn about Fred Hampton. Mm -hmm. uh, I had heard little pieces from him uh, and so on and so forth. And I had learned a little bit about how he had died, but I didn't really understand it. I watched, uh, there's a piece, uh, the assassination of Fred Hampton. I think I found it through democracy. Now I think is where I found it. And that especially, uh, made me think is that the issues are serious and the problems are lingering and we need a plan and a system. And part of that is uh, I, all I can do is my part. In that, and so uh, I, if I'm going to help uh, us learn about what it's going to take to make sure that if we have a revolution, that it ends the way we want it to, and not with the wrong people getting beheaded or with the the wrong people, <laughs> or anyone getting beheaded. <laughs> Ideally, I mean, that, like I think we want redistribution. Maybe not. I don't. I don't know if beheading them quite gives us what we want, other than right? like a quick sense of, all right, we did it, but then we need stuff redistributed too. <laughs> yes, and that, and I think uh, a lot of, it's easy to get caught up in wanting to to just, uh, like, I mean, Wall Street was, had a little blip, and there was an urge to, like, you know, that people want to, you know, would pay you know, good good premiums for front row tickets to watch it burn down, but burning all of the stolen loot doesn't help us. Right. <laughs> Like we'll we'll be closer together, but we'll be all worse off. And so, like, part of the key parts, part of uh, what I'm, the little I've learned so far about understanding revolutions and that have taken place, or people that have done revolutionary acts and so on and so forth, is that planning and and thought and learning are, are going to be critical. And so, knowing, like, I see some of my friends have kids, so I see young people and how they interact with the world. Uh, I think about somebody saying, oh, you want to start a revolution? Well, if you read this, uh, these first 12 books, then <laughs> you'll be you'll be ready to start having a conversation and listening to people to teach you about what you need to know to learn before you. And, and I was just like, I'm, I'm I'll, I will never capture them. <laughs> I, I will never get their support. It's it, it's not going to happen. And so 
I, if I'm going to do it, if it's going to happen, if I, if, if I want things to get better, if I want to improve things, I'm going to have to figure out a way to target them and target other people that, that I'm not personally exposed to, but that I know aren't getting, aren't going to get wrapped up in uh, several novel length uh, pieces before they like their, their problems and their feelings are more immediate and they're much more likely to want to clean up a, a, a tough part of their neighborhood or something like that. And they're going to want to be in. So like learning about how people have done those things or how they've done those projects have expanded, I think is going to be critical. Mm-hmm. I think it's well time to, I mean, to be honest, because we've been talking about this for like a few weeks or so, but I noticed recently um, on Twitter, but again, there's life beyond Twitter, which I'll get to in a second, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> but on Twitter, there was this big debate over the past few days about like whether or not we need to read uh, fundamental texts or quote unquote, like canonical texts like Marx and the like, should we be focusing on reading at all? Is there, you know, like, and I think sometimes um, people are also somewhat dismissive. So I think people reduce politics down to whether or not, as you said, whether or not you've read these like main 12 books or whatever books they yeah. are, you know, number is irrelevant, but you have to read this, this, and this before you can actually call yourself a communist. So you have to read this, that, and the third to be a socialist, whatever. And I think, you know, now we have a lot of, um, in the U S at least the thing that's been popping up a lot lately post uh, Bernie, but certainly before it as well is this idea of reading groups So um, leftist people, you know, leftist reading groups will come together and people will literally pick a night during the week, once a month and sit down and read a book. But then I'm thinking to myself, like, what if you work at night? What if you have kids? What if you have stuff going on and you just can't make it? Like, I think reading groups are great for people who maybe don't have those particular burdens. Um, But, you know, is there childcare at these readings? Is there someone who's going to like cook dinner while you're at that reading, you know what I'm saying? There's mm-hmm. a lot, there's a lot of like personal responsibility that we all have and whatever your class status or like life conditions are, you sometimes you're just tired and sometimes you want to be able to be more engaged, but you can't necessarily make it to these things. So we're kind of like bringing the reading group to you through this project. But I also think that like, you know, you and I have talked about this as well, this idea that there is a need to educate right? There is a need to educate and be educated ourselves if we're planning on actually looking toward a future that we want to see, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I I think I made the analogy something like, you know, if you're if you're going to like work a machine or if you're going to do any other sort of job, there's a manual, right? Like you have to be trained and you have to you have to Mm -hmm. understand what you're doing before you just like start operating this big piece of machinery or whatever. And I think that politics operate in the same way like we do need to understand what people have done before that worked or didn't work we need to understand our material conditions like we need to have a full understanding of what we're working with now that differs from in the, what happened in the past you know i mean i think that people who are revolting against slavery and people now who are revolting against like you know massive capitalism in the sense coming from wall street although they're technically both of those things were happening then too mm-hmm. um but, you know i think things look a little bit different now and we have to be i think we have to look and understand where they're coming where people were coming from ideologically like what their thoughts were but not necessarily we don't we don't necessarily have to do exactly what they did it's not a copy paste job right but we do need to know the fundamentals of you know, what people, what people thought about their conditions, how they responded to those conditions and how they responded to oppression. Um, And I think it's important also to have, have some established common ground and, and and like principles. And if we can disagree about how we apply those principles in practice, and and I think that's normal, I think. But if one of the things that I found, how, what catalyzed it for me, especially kind of going back a little bit to your previous question was, when I watched uh, the Fred Hampton video and the particular clip where he talks about, he says uh, something to the effect that in order to be a member, considered a member of the party, able to talk about the ideology of the party, you had to go through a six week training course. And I, the way I am, I immediately, you know, pause the video and Google. And I'm like, okay, where's the tw- the six week Black Panther training course so I can, you know, study up on this. Mm-hmm. And I uh, realized, well, it, it doesn't really, it wasn't, saved per se or like it's not easily accessible from uh google and i mean my google foo my google foo is reasonably strong but, <laughs> but like it's it's not a 
it's not there and sorry if that was offensive i don't like i'm one of the things i've learned like i said before i have checker pass ran with uh, a lot of people that i've learned that like the colloquial ways that we talked about things were actually incredibly offensive for large groups of people that i just wasn't aware of and so if and when i ever do that when you feel free to interrupt me and correct me and I apologize to your audience in advance. <laughs> no, but I think, I mean, I mean, in all honesty, though, like, I, I think that sometimes this, like, things that we're doing right now, like this, what we're going to do with the Reading Revolution part of the project, I think it's precisely what you're getting at. Like, I, I'm I'm less concerned about, like, if what you say is offensive or, or not. Um, <laughs> although I, I'm assuming you're making a reference to Kung Fu, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I didn't I know if I was I, inappropriate. I, I don't think you upset or... anyone with that. <laughs> if we're both upsetting people now, please, please write me and let me know that we're in the wrong, and we'll take it back and and talk about that. Um, but yeah, I think that you know, again, I, I think that what you're talking about right now is really it's sort of it has a parallel in leftist discourse, right? So a mm-hmm. lot of the time, you'll see people where it's like if you're off about one little thing, it's like, well, they didn't actually think that. They didn't actually do that. They didn't believe that. And everyone's just fighting already, you know, like it's like two minutes in and people are fighting about stuff that at the end of the day, the main goal is equality and the main goal is working towards that equality. And I think that sometimes people get distracted by semantics or by, you know, being to the letter exactly like what this particular philosopher did on the left. And I think the bigger picture is, you know, what's what are what's your larger takeaway from what they're saying? And how can you apply it in the real world? Um, and and how can we perhaps support candidates or go to protests or be involved in our communities in ways that align with those same philosophies? That's for me what's most important. So I'm less concerned about what particular type of leftist you identify as, for example. If you identify as a communist, a Marxist, a Marxist-Leninist, a socialist, an anarchist, whatever you decide is best for you is best for you. But I also understand that like our main goal is ultimately the same and that's what I care about. And that's why I think it's important to like read a lot of different types of people, not just the same as people call people say now, the same dead white guys over and over and over. Yeah. And then I guess I talked a lot about uh, Bernie and how he got me involved in this. I should contextualize that with that as of now <laughs> and how I like I see Bernie as much more of a centrist figure and I mm-hmm. recognize many of his flaws and shortcomings and so on and so forth. And so I, I've moved far left of Bernie, uh, <laughs> I, I, as I understand it. And as far as my identity goes, I, I haven't, I, I can't give myself a tag because I don't know enough about any of them. Uh, I've been called things. <laughs> 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 I, I'm not sure how accurate those, those were based off of what I was advocating or suggesting at the time. But I think that you're right. It, in, and I think it's important that when we like, the, some of the things I know is like uh, we want to make sure that people are fed, you know, sheltered, you know, clothed, uh, some basic necessities. These are we want to stop fighting each other. Like th- those are the some of the core tenets, I think. And how we go about doing those things, I think, is where a lot all the pol- a lot like a lot of politics comes about. But like among the left, I think the idea is that we're far too wealthy for it to be impossible, like mm-hmm. as impossible as they make it sound. Is like we should be able to feed, provide health care, you know, safe shelter, safe drinking water for everybody on the planet. We should do that with trillions of dollars in economic output. It, it's it's a tragedy and it's it's a uh, I shouldn't, it, it's an atrocity that we that we don't do that, that there are mm-hmm. kids in Yemen that are starving and suffering and that they're around the world. And just all of that, it, it's it's. To me, uh, as a human being, it, it makes me feel like, wow, we're really messing up. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of and it's a weird perspective, but a lot of it, a lot of my perspective comes from, well, if some alien superior alien race comes to Earth and wants us to explain our, our politics, like how, how would it work if they applied our thinking? And this especially applies to the United States. Uh, how would they apply our thinking uh, to a, a universe sized community? And and how would we fit in that? And essentially, we would be deemed a threat. And if it, like the the decent people in the in this uh, whatever uh, space community would argue to leave us alone, and most people would, or in the large section, would be arguing the section that represented us, the United States, would be saying we need to kill kill the, those humans now before they're a danger to all of us. Mm-hmm. And so, like, my, I I would like to shift our politics in a in a direction that leads us to where is like 
no, our position is that as being as as living beings, we deserve dignity and uh, respect and that we should treat all living things with dignity and respect and so on. And like and that as as part of that philosophy, the superior race that could eliminate us should do the same. I'd like to I'd like to at least have that moral high ground. Well, <laughs> now that you officially uh confirmed yourself as a complete nerd uh talking about <laughs> aliens and the like i'm gonna wrap it up um. <laughs> oh yeah that, that, that's if, if you're wondering the kind of person that you that you're that's what you're gonna get from me so i apologize <laughs> if that's not what you're expecting but hopefully some people can relate and uh, that uh, we'll be able to share those experiences that are learning together and yeah. I, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm, I'm so thankful that, that to be a part of this. And I, I am a bit of a sci-fi nerd, so I'm sorry about that. Well, you'll definitely be able to inject it, uh, in, inject our discussions with that, because I am not. So I will learn from you as well on this particular side of things. Although it is interesting, you know, I def- one thing I know for sure about sci-fi is that most of it acts as like parable or, you know, like satire mm-hmm. about what's going on politically, right? Um, mm-hmm. So there's definitely something to be said about overlaps between left politics and science fiction so i'm not totally uh, discounting your nerdiness but uh, i'll plug there's a great <laughs> discourse episode uh, I, i'm not part of it but uh brandon sutton uh, uh work with uh did a great interview with uh, it's about hollywood but they get into a little bit about sci-fi and how uh, time travel is also a great tool and so i'll plug that because i really enjoyed that as well <laughs> nice well i'll definitely include that in the show notes um <laughs> and again thank you so much richard i really appreciate not only your being on this particular episode episode um but also for just being involved in this project and by coming to me and saying like we should do something like this and so i'm really looking forward to reading revolution with you and i hope that the audience enjoys what we have planned because there is quite a bit in store for you guys so i have to shout out to noah for help giving me the courage to approach wendy on this too <laughs> like i, I was like Chonga, oh, by the way for folks yeah. who don't know who Ana- Ana- you should know who Anoa is but if you don't Anoa Changa, who's the way with Anoa. She has her own uh, show, podcast, et cetera. Uh, I thought, you know, or I thought uh, Wendy was going to know what kind of nerd I was and be like, oh, that's nice. And that, that's cute. <laughs> and pat me on the head and send me on my way. But I'm um, so I'm really excited and happy that we were getting to do this. Yeah. And also, um, I just want to shout out Anoa, too, because Richard and I were talking about this uh, off air before we started recording. But Anoa was one of the people who really, you know, like emboldened me during the primaries and made me say like, oh, I'm not that weird. You know, like I'm not being weird for having left politics in the United States as a black person. Mm -hmm. And while I know that, you know, from what I study, I knew that there were leftists of color all over the place and that it wasn't rare. I think during the primaries, it felt like, you know, the house was coming down on us because there were a lot of black people who were at least in the mainstream media, right? Uh, Sort of applauding Hillary Clinton and pushing her um, as the next president of the United States, despite many of the problems that she had Um, in the Black community in particular, right? So I found myself sort of at odds with even people that I looked to for um, academic or political reasons who kept pushing her as the candidate and the only candidate, right? Um, So it was was refreshing to have people like, no problem. It was refreshing to have people like Anoa on the the Twitter sphere, in the Twitter sphere and on YouTube and, and the like. So her, Ben, people like you and Brandon, many other people at Progressive Army and other outlets too. There, you know, um, shout out to Eugene per year. There's so many other people who were um, on the left to some degree and who identify as people of color who were really inspiring to me. So I have to also give them props for putting me in the position that I am to, you know, really start thinking about these things in a much more, um, I don't know, a real way, not just like by myself and in my research, but actually expanding beyond that. So I really appreciate them as well. And on that note, uh, I think we're going to head out. But thank you so much again, Richard. And again, be on the lookout, listeners who followed the Left Pocket Project. Be on the lookout for Reading Revolution, uh, which we'll be posting pretty much maybe maybe at the end of this month, beginning of March. But it's coming out soon. Thanks again and have a good one. Thanks. And thank you for listening to Episode 9 of the Left Pocket Project podcast. Don't forget that you can always interact with The Left Pocket Project, the platform that seeks to bring you the histories of leftists of color one swipe at a time, via social media, via at LeftPOC on Twitter, Facebook, Media Revolt, Reddit, and Curious Cat. You can also listen to the podcast on SoundCloud, Spreaker, and iTunes. Be sure to rate and review when you have a chance as well. Finally, if you can spare $1 or more a month, 
please become a patron by going to patreon.com slash leftpoc. Thanks again so much for listening. Have a good one.